So, uh, so last time, just to summarize what we did, uh, we described the Quillen equivalences. So there are special adjoints between uh, two model categories that induce uh, an equivalence between homotopy categories. So we gave uh, several uh, criteria for uh, this equivalence. Uh, and so our goal essentially for today will be to show that there exists such a, such a Quillen equivalence between the category of uh, simplicial sets that you learned about uh, in the homotopy one class and the category of topological spaces with uh, the Quillen structure. All right. Uh, also something that we did last time was uh, homotopy limits and co-limits. Uh, so I didn't give too many examples of them. Uh, I guess you should look in the notes. So one example would be uh, the homotopy push-out. So if you look at the category of push-outs and you apply the theory that we saw uh, last time, uh, you will see that, uh, maybe I can do it on the side. So for example, if you look at uh, top to the power uh, like this, so this category, uh, this is a model category because this is a very small category, all right? And uh, a diagram uh, like this is a uh, cofibrant if at least one of the two maps is a cofibration. All right. Uh, maybe even, uh, so when you want to compute uh, the homotopy push out of a diagram, what you need to do is to replace one of the two maps by cofibrations. And there is a, a canonical way of, uh, of doing this. Uh, where uh, I guess, uh, for example, oh, sorry, uh, what I wrote here is not uh, what I wanted to write. So, for example, if you want to compute the homotopy push out of A and B, so if you have a diagram like this and you want to replace one of the two maps by a push out, a canonical way of doing it is to replace this map by its uh, cylinder. So you take A cross zero one and you take the union with C along C, uh, along A cross one. So you use this map to identify C with a subspace of A, or well, not necessarily a subspace, but something like this. And then this is a cofibration. So this is uh, one way of doing homotopy pushouts in topological spaces. So there are many examples. Uh, so here you have uh, the cylinder of A, union B, with C. All right. So, okay. So someone is asking what's the model structure. So this is the projective structure. Uh, so it's an exercise to, to see that. Uh, so in the projective structure, vibrations are defined pointwise. And uh, I will let to check that if you have a diagram like this in, win, in which, uh, uh, so you first have to check that if both maps are cofibrations, then this is a cofibrant diagram, all right? So it means that it has the lifting property with respect to all acyclic vibrations. And then you can uh, replace this diagram by uh, an equivalent diagram with, for which uh, the homotopy, uh, for which the co-limit is the same, where an, only one of the two maps is a cofibration, not need both. But to check that something is cofibrant, you have to check that something uh, has the lifting property with respect to all uh, weak, uh, sorry, fi uh, acyclic vibrations. So you have to take uh, another pair of diagrams like this, and assume that all of these are acyclic vibration and you have to assume that you have something like this and you want to check that you can lift it to this diagram, right? So the idea that I explained last time is that you first leave the map from C, right? So of course, I should have said it, C has to be cofibrant itself. And so you first leave the map from C and then you want to lift the map from A and B, but keeping in mind that they have to commute with inclusions. So you have to add, add some property. And if it's a cofibration, you will see that uh, it's possible to lift the map from 
A to B pra to E to B into a map from A to E, which makes the whole square commute. So you have to use this, uh, this kind of matching object that I described last time. I probably did not use this name, but uh, you know, it was this uh, D uh, K of the diagram. So this is a, an exercise to show that in this case, you can have that these diagrams are cofibrant. I'm not saying that these are all the cofibrant diagrams, but at least these ones are. All right. So any questions about uh, what we did last time before we start uh, working on simplicial sets? All right, so today we are going to start, uh, well, I guess it's the second chapter in my notes, official sets. So you, most of you already saw simplicial sets in the course of uh, Bruno Vallet. Uh, let me give a very brief uh, reminder of what simplicial sets are. Uh, I suggest that uh, if you are un unfamiliar with them, you go look to the notes of Bruno Vallet. Uh, I also have a quick introduction in my own notes, but I guess the ones of Bruno are uh, longer because it was the whole goal of his course. Uh, so we start with uh, this definition of uh, the simplex category. So the simplex category delta is where objects of delta are finite, totally ordered sets, bracket n. All right, so you have, uh, we only consider uh, these sets, right? We could consider all finite, totally ordered sets, but there's no, not really much point. And morphisms. So the home sets in delta from n to n are uh, non decreasing maps. Okay, so this category essentially encodes the relations between the different simplices. So, I know that you already saw this in the course of Bruno, but I'm just saying all this to recall the notations, maybe introduce some of the notations that are not exactly how they were in Bruno's talk. So an element F from bracket M to bracket N. So there is a useful notation that I will use. It's the following. I will just write F0 then F1 and F2, uh, Fn. So for example, the identity of bracket three, I would denote it as zero, one, two, three, right? So this is a, a notation that is uh, usually useful. So you have to have uh, this uh, non-decreasing condition, right? You cannot ever go lower once you have. Uh, so F of zero has to be at most equal to f of one, which has to be at most f of two and so on. All right, so as you saw last semester, there are some uh, very fundamental uh, maps in this category. So uh, any morphisms decomposes in terms of two kinds of maps. So you have the cofaces di from bracket n minus one to bracket n, where uh, you have uh, zero less than i less than n. So bracket uh, di. So this is my notation. Uh, typically, I will put an exponent whenever something is co-simplicial rather than simplicial. So this is simply the morphism that misses the number i. 
right? The unique uh, injection that misses I. So these are called cofaces. And you have co-degeneracies, which are surjections. So again, you have zero, J, like this. So sigma J is the unique surjection that repeats J, right? So maybe in more detail, you have J minus one, J, J again, then J plus one, N. All right. So these are very fundamental maps. They satisfy a bunch of relations. I'm going to write. So, of course, as you learned last semester, you should not learn these relations by, by heart. There's not really a point. You just have to think about what they do. Uh, on uh, like If you have a composite of several maps, you should learn. Well, you should think about what they do on elements, not try to work with relations themselves because, well, there are five of them and remembering them all is not as easy as it, as it sounds. So di, uh, sorry, dj di is equal to di dj minus one for uh, i less than j. So this is uh, how cofaces interact. Then you have a variation that tells you how co-degeneracies interact. So something similar. All right. And then you have how cofaces and co-degeneracies interact. So sigma j di can be equal to several things. So it can be the identity if i is either j or j plus one. It can be uh, d sorry di sigma j minus one if i is strictly less than j. And it is di minus one sigma j if i is strictly greater than j. Right. So you have these relations, and essentially we encode relationships between simplices. Right. So I'm basically taking for granted that uh, you have seen this last semester. Uh, again, if you have not, I strongly suggest that uh, you go take a look in uh, the notes of last semester. I will give some very uh, fast explanations, but I don't really have so much time to, to delve into detail into what this all means. And finally, a simply short set is a contravariant functor. So typically, a simply short set, I will denote it with a, a bullet at the, at the subscript. So again, whenever I will put something in the subscript, it means that it is contravariant. And whenever I put something in the superscript, that it means that it is covariant, right? So using this description, a simplicial set, uh, and a, sorry, I should say a map, a simplicial map, is a natural transformation. So that means it's a collection of maps from each level to the, from each xn to the yn, such that it commutes with all the simplicial structure maps. And so a simplicial set can be described as well, 
a collection of sets. So typically we will denote it as x is xn for n at least zero. Faces, so s, uh, sorry, di go from xn to xn minus one for all zero, xn i less than n. And degeneracies, so s j from xn uh, to xn plus one for all zero to n. Right. So again, this is my notation. Uh, Co-faces, I will put this uh, partial operator and I will put the i in exponent. And for the faces, I will put uh, a, a d, Latin d, with an i in the subscript. And uh, similarly here, I will put sigma and s, right? Okay. So as you saw last semester, these uh, sets are, and these, uh, these faces and degeneracies are basically a way of encoding like simply short complexes, but uh, in, a, in a very combinatorial way. So for example, uh, you have, uh, so for example, you have, uh, there is a canonical simply short set, which is denoted by delta n, which is simply a home of the delta category into the n. So essentially it's given by the Yoneda embedding of a delta into the precise category, All right? And so this simplex, you have to think about it in, as some kind of an, an actual simplex. So delta zero is simply a point Delta one is an interval, delta two is a triangle. So typically uh, zero, zero, one, zero, one, two. Delta three is a tetrahedron. Like this, and your edges are oriented like this, and so on, all right? And when you have a big simplicial set, an element of the Xn is essentially one of these simplices. And the faces tell you how the face of the simplices are glued to one another. And the degeneracies tell you that some of the simplices are actually collapsed and uh, are actually coming from lower dimensional simplices. All right. So I don't know, do I need to give uh, more detail about all of this? Uh, I know that some of you were not uh, in Bruno's course, but uh, I said at the beginning that you should try to get back uh, to speed about this. So does anyone, it's, it's uh, completely okay, but uh, just let me know now. <laughs> Should I need, a, should I give some more detail about how to interpret these uh, kind of objects in terms of topological uh, intuition? It's difficult to say with uh, dark screens in front of me, but anyway. Okay, so if there is something unclear about how you should interpret some something that I'm writing down, just please let me know. Uh, anyway. So let, let me also make a, a remark. So using, uh, again, I know that you saw this last semester, but I'm going to use it several times. So, so using the Yoneda lemma, a simplicial map from delta n into some simplicial set x is the same thing as an n simplex, All right? Yeah, you apply the Yoneda lemma, you get that natural transformation from this uh, co-representable uh, functor into x is simply the value of x on n. And also as a corollary, so there is uh, some very strange looking formula, but it 
something like this. So essentially, any set, any simplicial set is built from standard simplices. So whenever you have a simplicial set, you can write it as a co-limit of a lot of uh, standard simplices that are glued and uh, collapsed in the, some way, all right? So this is something that I'm going to use uh, a few times. So if I recall, I, I read Bruno's note and, and the were in, in the, this thing was in the notes if I remember correctly, but uh, again, if there is something that uh, you don't remember very well or you are not sure, uh, just please let me know. Oh, and maybe some terminology, simplex X in XN is called degenerate. If there exists Y in XN minus one, such that X and there exists uh, some J, such that X is SJ of Y. All right. This is all the terminology that I'm going to need. Maybe one proposition that you saw last time was the following. So let uh, W in Xn be a simplex. And there exists, uh, I will write it in, in words, there exists a unique there, y sigma, where, uh, well, first of all, uh, y is in xm and sigma goes from uh, bracket m into bracket n, oh, bracket n into bracket m is a surjection. such that y is non-degenerate and x is sigma upper star of y. So we are here, I have a, a map in delta and it acts on simplices of a simplicial set using the fact that it's a contravariant functor. All right, so this is a property that you saw in uh, Bruno's course. So just to give you a reminder of how uh, proofs go in, in the simplicial world, so assume that W is equal, so you can decompose any surjection as a composition of elementary codegeneracies. Uh, so you can assume that you have two, two different uh, pairs so first of all, you can write it like this and you can also write it like this. So SJ zero uh, and so on, SJL of Z. All right, by definition, because uh, you can do by induction, the fact that there is, a, that it exists, right? Either W is degenerate or not. If it's not, then okay. If it is degenerate by definition, you can write it like this. And then you do the same with Y. And because the dimension decreases every time, then at some point you stop. Uh, at worst, you stop at uh, dimension zero. But now, how do you prove that it is uh, unique? So you assume that you, had, you have two such decompositions. And let us show that uh, y is equal to z, all right? Uh, where uh, y, z are non degenerate, all right? But then uh, using the simplicial relation, so this is a nice proof, simplicial relations. 
Uh, you have a following uh, y is d i k blah, 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 d i zero s i zero s i k of y because whenever you have d i zero s i zero it cancels it becomes the identity and then you do it uh, k times and you get to this but then you replace uh, this thing here by W and then you replace it by this. So this is D I K blah, 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 D I zero S J zero now S J L of Z. And using the simply showed relations again, this is equal to S uh, so something S something D something the something of the right using the simplicial relation you can swap uh, all the s's to the left and all the d's to the right i don't really know what the indices will be in the end it's, it depends on the order but anyway this there is a way of uh, putting all the s to the left and all the d to the right and so because y is non-degenerate We must have L equals zero, all right? But then this means that W is equal to Z. All right? And so it means that uh, the dimension of Z, of Y, is lower to or equal to the dimension of z because w is equal to z and therefore z is a degeneracy of y and so y is a lower dimensional than z but my argument I, I chose to start with y i could have chosen to start with z so by symmetry the dimension of z is less than or equal to the dimension of, of y and so using this and the fact that uh, y is a, co is a face of z, we must have k equals zero because otherwise y would be of strictly smaller dimension than z. And so in, in the end, y equals z, all right? So you don't have a choice. All right, so this is a very typical of a kind of argument that we see the, with a simplicial set, right? This is why I wanted to have some kind of a reminder about this. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Um, but here we proved that uh, L equals to zero, mm -hmm. but uh, it shows that uh, W is non-degenerate. Uh, not, yes. It's strange because we could take the same writing uh, twice and for all uh, uh, W. Uh, oh, uh, I see where my mistake is. Uh, in fact, there is not necessarily the same. Oh, sorry, yeah, I should have been more careful. There is not necessarily the same number of uh, L as there was here because uh, one of the variations, yeah. Thanks for noticing this. Is that here you can have the identity? If you try to put all the s at the left, it's possible that uh, at some point you you lose one. So l prime is zero. Yeah, sorry about that. And so y is a face of z. All right. Y is a face of z. And so its dimension uh, is lower than the dimension of z. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you you are right. It would have been uh, too easy otherwise. <clears throat> Every simplex would have been non-degenerate. Uh, so yeah, so this thing here is does not exist, but it's possible that uh, when we swap all the s on the left, uh, we we lose some uh, some of the s's because we have some identities coming up.
right? Uh, but still, we have that y is d of something of, of z. So it, it is a lower dimensional. Similarly, z is lower dimensional by symmetry. So they have to have the same dimension. And therefore, uh, you cannot have actually any face. Here. All right, so is everyone comfortable with this kind of uh, argument? And don't hesitate to, to interrupt if, uh, if you have some trouble about uh, all this. All right, so uh, this was the first part, some kind of brief introduction, uh, but not not much of an introduction because uh, I'm basically assuming that we've already seen these kind of things. Uh, I will give later some arguments where we see better the, the topological uh, picture, like actually right now. So I'm going to recall what the geometric realization is, something that you saw last time. Right. So first definition, a co-simplicial space is a covariant vector uh, from delta to top. And more generally, you can define co-simplicial objects in any category, also simplicial objects in any category. Uh, so typically, this is uh, the data of uh, X upper bullet, which is a collection of spaces. So there is one issue with that notation is that it's possible to confuse this with uh, the product of X with itself and time. Usually there is no issue, but uh, I will try to, to make this clear. Uh, when it's necessary, plus you have co-faces like this, and plus co-degeneracies like this. Uh, what am I writing? Uh, co-faces, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, go like this and like this. Right, so it's basically the dual of a simplicial thing. So the standard, what's my name? Standard uh, simplex top. So there is uh, something that looks like a standard simplices in top in the simplicial sets, but is something in top. So I will uh, denote it, I will try to make a distinction between the two by uh, denoting it like this, delta with a double bar, right? This is the subspace of R to the N plus one, such that for all I, Ti is non-negative and T zero plus and so on plus Tn is equal to one, All right? So now we have actually the picture I drew before. So delta zero, what is delta zero? It's a subspace of R such that, well, Ti is positive and T zero is equal to one. So it is just a point. So maybe I will make a picture like this. So this is delta zero. Then you have delta one, which is included in, uh, in the plane. It's the subspace of pairs, such that each member is uh, non-negative and the sum is equal to one. So it's basically a segment like this. So this is delta one. And then you have delta two, which is a subspace of R3, where you have three coordinates. They are all non-negative and their sum is one. So this is uh, this triangle here. And well, I can draw, uh, so this is a delta two. 
that's a zero. Uh, I can do, I can draw a delta three. It's as before, uh, this were here. But of course, I cannot uh, draw it as a subspace of uh, R4. It's a bit complicated. But anyway, delta three is a homeomorphic to this, to this space. All right. And we have a uh, Co simply shown structure on co collection delta bullet. Uh, so the co face delta i of t0 up to tn, you just put a zero in the correct uh, spot. And the code degeneracy is when you add make sure I write it in the correct place. You add two consecutive uh, coordinates. So for example, uh, well, these are pictures that you saw uh, before. For example, delta zero from delta zero to delta one. Well, you just put a zero in the first position. So you send the, this, this as delta one. You send this to this. So essentially this in, a, in the interval here, this is D one of delta zero, and here this is d zero of delta one, of delta zero. And if you look inside of a big uh, simplex uh, triangle delta two, where here you have zero, one, two, well, delta zero misses, it's exactly as in the simplicial thing, misses zero, so here you have d zero, of delta one and so on. Delta one misses this one, so it will be this segment and delta two would be this one. Uh, and then uh, you have a code degeneracy which collapse some things. So essentially it collapses two consecutive uh, points. So for example, sigma, uh, sigma zero from delta two to delta one since T0, T1, T2, to uh, T0 plus T1, T2. And there is a, a way of understanding it. It is the unique uh, affine map, which on vertices is defined by the co-degeneracy of before. So it will send both zero, it will repeat point zero. So therefore two is sent to one. And so on, on vertices, it is defined as the map that, that collapses zero to one. So it will do something like this. It will uh, collapse this thing uh, like this, right? So it's a unique um, affine map that sends this vertex to zero, this vertex to zero, and this vertex to two, right? So hopefully these are things that you all saw from last semester, I hope. If something again isn't clear, uh, I will, uh, <clears throat> I can uh, give more details of course. No? All right. So from this thing, this co uh, topological space, we can define an adjunction between simplicial sets and topological spaces, which will basically, in one direction, when you go from topological spaces to simplicial sets, you get something which is basically the singular homology or cellular, uh, sorry, singular chain complex of your space. Uh, well, it's not a chain complex, but there is a way of making a chain complex out of it. And the other way around, uh, you do what 
the topological intuition for uh, simply short sets is for each n simplex, you put a copy of an n simplex like this, an actual topological n simplex. And then you have a whole lot of identifications that tell you that the face of a simplex should uh, be glued together in the way that the faces of your simplicial sets uh, prescribe. And similarly, the degeneracies of your simplicial set tell you how the simplicial sets should be collapsed, All right? All right, so I'm explaining it again, but I know that you saw this last semester. So let uh, X bullet be a simplicial set. It's geometric. Realization is the topological space given by so the notation is you put two bars, one on each side. So the definition is a bit uh, a bit complicated, but not that much. Take xn, you cross it with delta n. So for each element of xn, you get an n simplex, right? And you take the disjoint union of all of these. And then you model by some relation where the relation is generated. So is the equivalence relation. generated by, well, two kinds of relations. First of all, uh, dix t is identified by x di t and sjx t is identified with x sigma j t, where uh, x is in xn t well, it cannot be the same t in both cases. So t prime, t is in delta uh, n minus one. And this one is in delta n plus one. All right. So whenever you have a simplex, if you take its face, the coordinates of uh, the simplex the topological simplex that correspond to this simply short simplex, I don't know how to call it, is, in, is identified. Uh, and similarly, whenever you have a codegeneracy, you collapse the simplex like this. All right. Okay. So when you think about geometric realizations, uh, it is typical to only think about uh, non-degenerate simplices, but they're actually here for a reason. It's actually to, to define simplicial maps themselves more easily. Uh, but if you want to have some topological intuition, you can uh, get away with basically only thinking about non-degenerate simplices, uh, and, uh, thinking that they are glued uh, together along their faces in some uh, in some way. So there is a, a very uh, easy proposition. Uh, ah, so okay. Someone is asking it can be made functorial, but can you remind us what the definition of morphisms are? Uh, okay. Uh, so this uh, defines a functor from simplicial sets to topological spaces. Uh, as follows, if f from x to y is a simplicial map, then uh, there is an induced map I don't know, uh, realization of F from the realization of X, the realization of Y defined by, uh, well, let's say on uh, X 
T Xn cross delta N by so you just take Fn, you apply it to X and you don't change the coordinate. Right. And this is compatible with the relations because uh, well essentially F commutes with faces and codegeneracies. So maybe I give one example just to you know, get you back into the game of thinking about uh, geometricalization. So well, first of all, a proposition which uh, well, which follows by the kind of like the Yoneda lemma, uh, the realization of the, the simply shell standard simplex is equal or homeomorphic depends. Well, it's a homeomorphic to a standard and simplex. I'm writing you an edalema. Well, it's a bit debatable, but uh, essentially that's what it is. Uh, maybe one thing I think I, I, can, I can mention is that uh, there is a like a general theory that. Uh, that describes this kind of space. This can de be described as some kind of thing called a, a co-end. So you can guess there is a dual notion called an end, right? En français, une fin et une co-fin. Uh, and uh, there is a general statement that uh, if you decide to put a representable functor here, uh, and you simply get something easy. But I won't get into too much detail about this. Uh, maybe another example. So example. Uh, consider uh, the following uh, simply show set. Uh, so you define x0 to be uh, one vertex. Mm -hmm. And x1, you have, uh, well, it's a bit uh, annoying to write. You have uh, some edge E and you have a degenerate simplex, how to call it, uh, I don't know, V1. And then you have a bunch of degeneracies. So, okay, uh, I will write it in a more, uh, in a more, uh, How to say systematic way. So here you have 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. Where while di is, uh, you forget. If uh, index, and if we get this, and SJ is a repeat J index. All right. So claim. The geometric realization of X is homomorphic to S1. Well, how do, you, how do you see this? Well, you start from X0, you have one vertex indexed by zero, All right? Then you have X1, you have two edges, zero, zero, and zero, one. But now you have two, two kinds of identification. First of all, this one is the degeneracy of this one. So this whole simplex is actually collapsed 
and I identify with zero. You forget it. And then this simplex, its first face is identified with zero, and its second face is also identified with zero. You get one edge and you glue it like this. And then you look at the higher simplices, and they are all degenerate. For example, this one is equal to either S0 or S1 or this one. So you take a, a triangle if you want, 0, 1, 2, but you collapse it along to get this edge. Similarly for this one, similarly for this one, they are all degenerate. So you add new simplices all the time, but then you all collapse them. And so in the end, all you get is the two non-degenerate simplices, which are glued along the faces. Right? So that's one way of looking at geometric realization. Again, I'm not giving a lot of details, but uh, well, I know you saw this uh, last semester. So, right. So any questions about all this? So now let's talk about the over adjoint. So let uh, Y is a topological space. We define its singular set as S bullet of Y. That's the notation is the singular set of Y, which is a, a simplicial set by SN of y is simply all maps from the standard simplex or continuous map into y, right? With the simplicial structure uh, well di of f is f circle di and SJ of F is F circle sigma J. Uh, and this one can also be made functorial. Whenever you have a continuous map, you post compose all your maps by this continuous map and you get a functor induced like this. All right. So if you think about it, this is kind of like the singular uh, chain complex. Actually, you can build a chain complex out of this one. Uh, like you can build a, a chain complex out of any simplicial set. And you will get precisely the chain, singular chain complex of your uh, topological space. All right, and now let me finish with a proposition that you learned about uh, last semester. So these two functors Define uh, okay, my pen is not working. Uh -huh. uh, okay, uh, sorry, I have a technical issue. Right, uh, sorry, I had a technical issue. Can you can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Wait, okay. Uh, my my screen uh, completely froze for uh, a few few seconds. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry about that. All right, so I was saying these two functors define an uh, adjunction. So geometric realization is the left adjoint and singular complex is the right adjoint. Okay, uh, it's actually a, a nice exercise to, to show that it's an adjunction. Uh, well, the proof you saw it last semester or it's in my notes. It's basically very formal. Uh, there is uh, not much to say, but uh, yeah. uh, 
someone is uh, mentioning uh, Dolcan. Uh, well, uh, it's it's not exactly uh, Dolcan. Uh, you have to do something first. Uh, well, let me uh, let me talk about it a bit because Dolcan doesn't take as input a simplicial set. It takes as input a simplicial abelian group, right? So how to get from uh, S bullet of Y to C star of Y? You have to do something first. Uh, you have to apply the linearization, All right? Where you just take the free abelian group in each, in each uh, dimension. Uh, and uh, the simplicial maps and uh, and uh, well, simplicial maps are induced just by the simplicial maps of S bullet of Y. So this is a simplicial set. This is a simplicial abelian group. And here, this is a chain complex. And here you have a Dolkan equivalence. Right. Uh, so there is a question which says singular complex associates. Uh, but I'm sorry, what do you mean? Uh, ah, okay, All right. Yeah, so yeah, the answer is that it's almost Dolkan, but you, you have to apply this step here, which is, uh, well, it's not, it's not a trivial step <laughs> from a homotopy point of view, but uh, well, cannot be because uh, here the, this thing you have the whole homotopy type of y and here you just have uh, well, homology basically so, so yeah there is something uh, something here but yeah all right uh, okay so as a remark and then we can have a, a short break because it's, it's been one hour uh, we can do this in uh, any co-complete category if we are given a co-simplicial uh, object inside. Right, you see that basically here, uh, this uh, geometric realization and this singular set, they basically only depend on the uh, standard co-simplicial space, uh, the simplices. Uh, if you take another category, which is co-complete because you have to do a co-limit inside uh, this geometric realization, then you get the exact same adjunction. Right. So the goal, and then we can have a break. Define a model structure on a set such that this is a Quillen equivalent. All right. So I guess it's time to have a, a short break. Uh, does anybody have any questions? before we have this break. No, all right, so I will just pause the, the recording for, all right. So let's have a, a very uh, brief, uh, uh, thing about uh, boundaries, uh, horns, and skeleton. Skeleton is the plural of skeleton. Right. Well, so I'm going to introduce a few interesting uh, simplicial sets that are going to be central to the definition of the model structure. Uh, all right. So let uh, this be the 
Speak. Non degenerate. Simplex. N simplex of delta N. Uh, boundary. Delta N is the sub, oh, and uh, maybe some remark. Uh, typically, I will not write the bullet uh, at the bottom. Hopefully, this does not cause any confusion. Uh, so, this is the sub uh, simplicial set of delta N. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, this is the smallest sub. Uh, well, I should say simply short subset that contains the I EDN all I. All right. So visually, uh, this is exactly what you expect. Uh, you take uh, the simplex here and so you have uh, the, the simplex it's, uh, itself, which is uh, n-dimensional, and you take the faces of uh, the main uh, cell, right, uh, inside, and you get uh, a bunch of cells of uh, one dimension lower, and you take the union of all of these, and you get a simplicial subset. Uh, so this is basically that. So concretely, there is uh, an actual concrete uh, definition of uh, this thing here. So let's say this is the set of uh, F in delta and I such that F is not surjective. So it misses at least one element, right? So up to dimension uh, n minus one, there can be non-degenerate simplices, but starting at dim dimension n, because it's not surjective, it's images of, of cardinality at most n minus one, and therefore it's, uh, it's, it's not injective either, and therefore it is not, uh, it's, for, it's, it's degenerate, right? right. Uh, okay, so this is for uh, n uh, at least zero. Uh, we also define the boundary of delta zero is just the empty simplicial set, right? Empty and in every dimension. Well, if it's empty in one dimension, it's empty in all dimensions, but definitely clear. So this is uh, essentially a convention, right? Okay. So any questions about this one? Okay, so let uh, now uh, N be at least one and uh, zero KN. So the cave horn. Lambda NK. So you have to be very careful about the notation here. The K that is here is not a simplicial index, right? This, this whole thing is a simplicial set and uh, it has things in uh, all dimensions. Okay. This K here is not similar to this I here. Just I know the notation is a bit uh, annoying, but it's completely standard. Uh, so this is the smallest simplicial subset that contains the i, so the i face of uh, unique and uh, not generate and simplex but for i different from k, all right? So it contains all faces except the i one. All right, so concretely, lambda nk 
in dimension i is the set of uh, n simplices of i simplices of delta n such that the image of f does not contain uh, everything but k. So essentially, it means that it misses. Uh, oh. So it, it means that it misses at least one element, which is not k, right? So in pictures. Here I have delta two. Uh, this is a zero one two. So lambda two zero contains all the faces except delta d zero. So this is lambda two zero. Similarly, lambda two one is this one, and lambda two two. Is this one? So from this picture, I guess you can guess where the notation lambda comes from. All right. And then in higher dimension, it's a bit more complicated. So of course, this one is included in the boundary. It's included in delta n. So one useful lemma uh, that uh, we can know now uh, interpret. Well, not interpret, but give a corollary that uh, will reflect something that we saw before. So for all uh, X simply short set, we have, so we can, uh, so you recall that uh, from, from delta N into X was XN. Well, we can define similarly homes from the boundary and home from the horn. So hum from lambda n k into x is in bijection with uh, things like this. So this is an element of x n minus one times n. All right, and so as you see, in order not to confuse this with some kind of co-simplicial index, I will put a, a little. Uh, Cross such that the i y j is d j minus one y i. So, and similarly, hum from the boundary into x is in bijection with y zero y n in x n minus one times n plus one now. So that, well, same condition, g i y j is g j minus one y. So how to interpret this? Uh, well, maybe I can write the, the canonical map. So the inclusion delta n, well, so from the n k included boundary included in n induces hum from delta n to x to hum from the boundary into x from to hum from the horn into x. So if you have some elements uh, x in x n, well, the corresponding element here is simply the set of its faces. So d zero x up to d n x. And here you simply miss one of the, uh, the faces, right? All right, so an element of this of this thing here is something that wants to be the set of faces of some simplices, of some simplex. It wants to be, uh, it's as if you, you had your simplicial uh, complex and you have a bunch of faces that uh, whose faces themselves intersect 
in the way that the faces of, of an actual simplex do, right? So it's something that could be filled by a simplex. And similarly, it's something that could be filled by a simplex, but there is one face missing. All right. So is this uh, okay for everyone? I saw it was also in uh, Bruno's note. notes, so I'm not going to, to prove it. Uh, but I will uh, include one corollary that uh, is going to be very useful for us. So the simply shall sets uh, lambda and k boundary of n and delta n are small, which means that home out of these uh, simply shall sets commute with uh, infinite uh, directed limits. Right. All right, so this was this condition uh, that uh, we had for, uh, how to say, uh, cofibrantly generating model category. So is that clear? Uh, well, I'm going to, to prove it, <laughs> uh, proof, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not that hard to see uh, from the description. Uh, I'm going to do it for uh, Delta N. So let uh, X zero, x1, x2, blah, 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 be a diagram of simply shown sets indexed by n. Okay, so again, be careful with the notation. This index here is not the simply shown degree, it's just some number, like we have a sequence of, of simply short sets, right? Uh, so let us prove that, and you are going to see it's not that hard, from, from delta n into the co-limit of the xi for i in n is in bijection with a co-limit for i in n with rom of delta n xi. Well, what is this set? By, the, by what we saw before, by the unit lemma, it's simply you take the co-limit of the xi and you look at what's in degree n. And here, this is the co-limit of the sets given by the n simplices of xi. And these two sets, are equal if uh, x in co-limit of xi is some n simplex, then it belongs. Essentially, the, the co-limit, what is it? It's some kind of increasing union. So if you have uh, one simplex, it's in uh, some big union. It has to be in one of the, the things in the union. So it has to has to belong to one of the xi. So it comes from the co-limit of the xi n. Similarly, and I will not write it down. If you have uh, something here, but here this is the co-limit. Well, you look at all the x, y0, yn, each of them comes from one of the xi. So let's say I, xi0, xin. You take the maximum of the n that appears, uh, and uh, all these uh, co come from the, this element, from uh, one of the xi, right? So this is uh, how we do it, and it's not that hard to see. Okay, is, that, is this uh, okay for everyone, this, uh, this proof?
Okay. Uh, ah, so question. What we have had by definition of colimits and free sheaves, it is immediate but equality. Uh, yes, uh, for pre sheaves, uh, this equality is, uh, is, is always clear. Clearly, but the intuition is, uh, is what I said. And uh, also for this one, it's not, uh, well, it's easier to think about it in these terms, right? I guess you could write it as some kind of colimit uh, in pre sheaves too, but uh, it's easier to think, well, each of the y's has to be in some finite stage because it's in the union and then they are in the largest one of the units that it occurs. But you are right for, for pre sheaves and uh, simply for sets are, are pre sheaves. Uh, this equality uh, colimits are computed pointwise in pre sheaves. Yeah. All right. Other questions? Uh, so it works for all colimits, not only over n. So this argument, yes, for delta n, but not the over two. Right, because at some point I have to say, um, well, I have all the yi's and I have to say that there is the largest one in which they, are, they all come from, right? So if you have some kind of directed uh, indexing category, like if every uh, element of your diagram uh, of your indices has some supremum, then uh, you can say, yes, uh, I take the, the supremum of all the terms in which the y's appear and it works. But it doesn't work for arbitrary uh, colimits, just directed colimits. And here, actually, I, I only want this particular kind of uh, directed polymits. Okay, is it uh, is it okay what I what I said? So we could say compact instead of small. Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, we we could say they are actually even compact. Uh, but for the small object argument, we just need small. <laughs> so I'm I'm seeking to. Easier, uh, easier property, but yes, they are compact actually. All right, other questions about all this? So as you can guess from what I'm saying, we are going to apply the theorem of co on cofibrantly generated model categories. Uh, so it's going to be a, a long process. It's not that easy to check it and actually we are I'm going to, to skip one thing because to do it, it would take me at least two hours to do this very small thing. You are going to see it's a very tiny step, but, uh, but anyway, uh, I will give a reference in which you can find a, a complete proof. Uh, it's, it's quite long, but we are going to do almost everything. But there is one step, it will take uh, a long time. And even what I've planned to do is going to take some, some time. All right, and we are not going to, to finish today, of course. So now the model structure. Uh, so what we need to do to apply the theorem on cofibrantly generated model categories, well, we need a class of weak equivalences. Uh, we need a class of vibrations. We need a class of cofibrations that are defined from generating cofibrations and also AC generating acyclic cofibrations, and we have to check a bunch of properties. So let me first deal with uh, vibrations because, uh, well, I, I need, uh, I will set some preliminary uh, well, statements. So you already saw vibrations uh, in the previous uh, course in uh, homotopy one. Uh, these are actually can vibrations. Definition, a can vibration is a simply shown map which has the right lifting property with respect to well, all 
be inclusions of the horns into the simplices. So essentially, whenever you have a horn like this mapping into uh, X, and you have uh, you can complete it inside Y, then you can complete it inside X. Uh, so, all right. So before I answer your question, let me just finish uh, this. So it means that whenever we have uh, X1, blah, 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 XK is missing, blah, 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 Xn into Xn minus one to the power N, such that Di Xj is D j x i minus one oh sorry g j minus one x y and y in x n such that uh, d i y is p of x i so whenever we have this there exists some x in x n such that x i is d i of x so essentially whenever have, for example, in dimension two, if you have one segment here, one segment here, and they share this vertex, then you can feel the interior of this horn, right? Right. Okay. So that's what it means to be a can vibration. So there is a question, can we transfer a model structure by equivalent equivalence? Uh, uh, I guess so. I guess it could be written uh, this way. What we are going to do is, is going to look a lot like a transfer structure, but uh, well, uh, given the, the next lemma actually, basically going to be a uh, transfer structure, but uh, while I'm not, I, I sh if I wanted to do this, I would need to, to state some theorems about uh, transfer structures and uh, these are more uh, complicated than what we need. But yeah, essentially I'm going to do it in a way that uh, is, a, is a transfer structure from topological spaces. But as I said, it's possible to do all of this showing that there exists a model structure completely internal to topological spaces, uh, completely internal to simplicial sets without talking about topological space. Uh, okay, so some terminology, a CAN complex is a simplicial set X such that the map to the terminal object, uh, simplicial set is a can vibration. Uh, so here it's called a, a complex. Well, this is a well a leftover from old uh, old terminology. Uh, just as some warning, I, I don't know if Bruno told you. Uh, now the terminology is standard. These are simplicial sets. Uh, before these were called uh, complete semi-simplicial sets or semi-simplicial sets or blah, blah, blah. There, were, there was a lot of terminology uh, changing in the, I guess, uh, 50s or 60s. Uh, I don't know exactly. So if you read uh, old papers, don't be surprised if you find different terminology, like uh, simplicial complex, semi-simplicial set, complete semi-simplicial set. You can basically find anything. Uh, right. Okay, so there is a, a lemma that I mean not going to prove because it's quite complicated. Well, it's not that complicated, but uh, takes some additional machinery that I don't want to, to do. A continuous map. P is a ser vibration if and only if when you apply a singular set functor, you get K 
can vibration, All right? Uh, well, the proof, uh, it's, it's actually not that, that uh, basically you just need to use the, the well, uh, we can give, uh, right, we don't really need that much machinery. Like for example, if we want to prove that uh, this, is this, all right, we want to find the lift here. This is equivalent to finding the lift here. But here, this is homeomorphic to, uh, to uh, 0, 1 to the power n minus 1. And here, this is homeomorphic to 0, 1 to the power n. So if you can find the lift uh, every time here, then you can find the lift every time here, essentially. So if this one is a self vibration, this one is a can vibration. So as a corollary, uh, S bullet of x is always a can complex because uh, x to the terminal topological space is always a ser vibration, right? Uh, a word of warning, uh, of course, I wouldn't write down a definition for this otherwise, but uh, not all simply sure sets are can complexes, of course. Well, you saw this last semester. Uh, for example, uh, delta two standard simply sure set is not a can complex. All right. Uh, let's show it. So let us define a map from lambda to zero into delta two by, well, y one is zero two and y two is zero one. So we do have uh, d i of y j j j sorry is equal to d j minus one of y i. Right, this is satisfied essentially because we have the same zero here. But there does not exist x in delta 2, 2 such that y1 is d1 of x and y2 is d2 of x. Because essentially, I have taken zero two, one, and I want to feel like this. And I want two to be smaller than one. Uh, this cannot happen. So this is, there, is, there does not exist uh, a two simplex with this boundary for D1 and D2. All right, simple as that. Okay. Any questions uh, so far? All right, so now we get to the main theorem of this, uh, well, one of the two main theorems of this chapter. Second one will be the existence of equivalent uh, equivalence. So there exists a co-fibrantly generated model category on a set where, well, so weak equivalences, so W, So these are simply show maps uh, f from x to y such that the geometric realization of f 
is a weak homotopy equivalent. Okay, uh, so that's what I meant when I said that uh, it looks like uh, something unsatisfying because the definition goes through topological spaces and uh, well, uh, one could think, yeah, maybe the equivalent structure, the model structure is a, uh, is made such that to create equivalence, but really you can define all of this internal to simplicial sets. Uh, but I uh, will not do it because it's a tiny bit simpler this way. So vibrations are can vibrations and co vibrations are just injections. Here we go. All right, and you have the set of generating co-fibration. I will be inclusion of delta n into delta n for n at least uh, zero. So in particular, it contains the inclusion of uh, the empty set into a point, huh? this is uh, important. And the generating acyclic Co-fibration will be this set J. Uh, so this map I will call it I N. And here you take the horns. Well, I don't really need to call it I N actually. Uh, you take the horn included in delta N for N at least one now. If you recall, I, I did not define uh, lambda zero zero uh, because I, I took uh, N at least one and uh, zero as than k as than n. All right. So this is the theorem that we are going to spend well what's left of today's lecture and probably all of Monday's lecture proving. Okay. Is this uh, good for everyone? Is the statement of this theorem? Um, yes, Any questions I have question. so uh, you said it was possible to do uh, the W internally with uh, a set. Uh, so we have uh, a bunch of uh, statements to check, right? We want to apply. The theorem on uh, cofibrantly generated model categories. All right. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of things. First one is that S set is uh, complete and co complete. And we define uh, limits and co limits pointwise. I will do the easy uh, statements first <laughs> we end with a hard one later. These are defined point wise. All right. Another thing uh, is that F is by definition the set of maps that have a right lifting property with respect to these maps. This is true by definition. All right. And finally, uh, the sources of elements of I and J are small. We checked this earlier. So these uh, three things to check are very easy. What we are going to check is the rest. All right, so there is a question. How can we define W without going through top? Can we use homotopy groups of S sets? Uh, yes, you will have to use uh, simply show homotopy groups that you saw last semester. Uh, it's, well, it's a bit complicated because uh, you want to do this. You want to use simply homotopy groups. 
The problem is that, well, when you don't have uh, can complexes, you cannot see, well, you can define some thing uh, that you could want to call homotopy group, but uh, it doesn't, it's not a good thing to define. Like uh, it's not even a group. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you have a problem. So what do you do? Uh, you can say, well, I define it as the homotopy group that has of any uh, fibrant replacement. But if you want to define a fibrant replacement, then you have to talk already about the model structure. So this, this doesn't work. So what you can do is define it as a, the, the simply show homotopy group of a, some thing that you know is a can complex and that then you define it's a bit, uh, how to explain? As I said, you want to, to define pi n of x, right? But you want to define it for, for uh, simply short sets which are not can complexes. So the classical thing to do is to define it as the pi n of some fibrant replacement, right? But what does it mean to be a fibrant replacement? It means that you have, uh, well, a fibrant object here. And uh, here it needs to be a weak homotopy equivalent. So you are trying to define weak homotopy equivalents at this point. So how do you do it? So that's why I don't want to, to go this route. Um, so what you can do, it's done this way in the book of uh, uh, Gers and Jardine that I give in as reference in my notes. Uh, they don't talk about the topological spaces uh, to define the model structure, but then it's it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, what you can do is, for example, define. So if you went to the exam of uh, of Bruno Vallet, there was this field called uh, X infinity, right, which is a can complex, and so that's where it gets a bit. Uh, and why we, we know somehow that it is a weakly homotopy equivalent to X. So we can define the homotopy group of X as the homotopy group of this one. Or, uh, well, you can do it as in the book of Gers and Jardy. All right. But you see there is uh, something a bit, uh, well, complicated at this stage because uh, you are in some kind of loop uh, when you want to define homotopy groups like that. All right, so that's why I decided to do it this way, but Gerset Jardin do it without uh, mention of topological space. So you can check it out. It's very nice, uh, very nice book, I think. I, I have it here, actually. <laughs> oh, you cannot see it because, uh, wow, you can see it. All right, anyway. Uh, so we are going to check uh, a bunch of properties to, to check uh, that the theorem can be applied. So the first theorem is that, well, uh, these uh, generating co-fibrations actually generate the co-fibrations that we have here, that is to say injective maps. All right. Uh, all right. So a simplicial map is uh, injective. And whenever I say this, I mean injective degree-wise, right? In each degree, it's injective. Uh, if, at an, if and only if, it is in this thing here, All right? So it means that this I, actually does generate our co-fibrations. Uh, moreover, uh, any co-fibration is in I cell, which is to say that uh, whenever, so if uh, K is included in L, simply a subset, then L can be obtained from K by gluing simplices, right? Whenever you start, for, you have an inclusion, 
a bigger simple, uh, set can be obtained from the smaller one by doing simplices, which is uh, pretty nice. Okay, so questions about the statement of this lemma. So this was one of the conditions to get a co-fibrantly generated model categories. Right. So proof, uh, we have to check uh, two things. First of all, that if you have something here, then it's injective. And if you have some injective map, then it satisfies this uh, lifting property. <coughs> so, First thing we check is that if some map, so get, you have to wrap your mind around what this notation means. If some map has the left lifting property with respect to all maps, which have a right lifting property with respect to all these inclusions, right? Then it is an injection. All right. So let f from uh, x to y belong to this thing. So it means that whenever you have a map which has a right lifting property with respect to inclusions of a boundary into a standard simplex, then f links, lifts against it also. Okay. So using the small object argument, we can factor F as uh, P infinity I infinity. So X goes into uh, from I infinity G infinity of uh, I F into y, where this is p infinity, where i infinity is in i cell. And p infinity has uh, the left, no, sorry, right lifting property with respect to i. All right. So to apply this uh, argument, we need to have uh, small so sources, but this is the case, all right? So we do this small object argument, right? We, we start from X and we glue a lot and a lot and a lot of cells. Uh, whenever we have a cell, well, uh, a boundary in, in X that can be filled in Y, we glue it to X. And then we do it again and again and again and again. So, and we do it an infinite number of times. And if we do this correctly, then well, by definition, this is a, a cellular I complex. And this one has the right lifting property with respect to I. All right, so in particular, by definition, P is a can vibration. Uh, Is true. Ah, uh, no, that's not what I want to say. Sorry, it's not a can vibration uh, because uh, if you recall, I is this map, right? It's uh, just the boundary into delta n. So it's not necessary. It doesn't necessarily have the right lifting property with respect to this one. All right. So in particular. F belongs to this thing here as the left lifting property with respect to P infinity, which is in this thing here, right? So as a consequence, F is a retract of I infinity. We saw this argument several times Right, so we want to do it like this. G infinity of I F 
uh, oh, sorry. So we want So in principle, all we have is something like this, right? And we want to be able to find something here that uh, makes the diagram commute so that F becomes a retract of, G of uh, this map here. So all we need to do is to do something like this. Uh, uh, do it like this. No, that's not what I want to say. No, no, no. Yeah, so I want to find a map from Y into G infinity. is always okay so this is f a infinity p infinity so we can find a map here because we have this left lifting property and you put this map here by definition by because this triangle commutes this is the identity and because this triangle commutes this square commutes all right therefore f is a retract of a infinity okay Is this good for everyone, this argument? All right. So F is a retract of I infinity. But I infinity, by definition, is a cellular I complex. So let me recall. F is a retract of I infinity. And I infinity is in I cell. So we want to prove that uh, F is a co-fibration, which is to say that F is injective, right? And being injective is uh, stable under retracts. So all we need to prove that I infinity is injective. So we just need to prove that if we have a cellular I complex, then it is injective. All right, but injections, so in set, injections are stable under pushouts and uh, N indexed limits. So I will explain why in an instant, but since elements of I, so this inclusion are injections, it follows that I infinity itself is an injection. Right. So in the end, F is a retract of an injection. Injections are stable and they are retracts. So F is an injection. So we have proved this inclusion. All right. So why are injections stable and their pushouts and N index colimits in sets? So you have to be careful here. Uh, you can think, all right, uh, we have monomorphisms and monomorphisms are stable. Huh? But actually, uh, it's the other way around. Uh, monomorphisms are stable under pullbacks and under uh, limits, not under uh, pushouts and co-limits. So there is some kind of uh, issue here. Uh, but so this statement here grows from the fact that injections are split 
monomorphisms in set. If I from A to B is an injection, then there exists P from B to A such that P circle I is the identity of A, right? Oh, well, split injections with a non empty uh, source, I guess. If the source is empty, uh, well, the inclusion uh, of the empty set into anything is stable and the retract and pullbacks, uh, push outs. Uh, I put M A empty. Right, this is obvious in sets. Uh, if an element of B is not in the image of A, I, you choose any element in I and you send it wherever. You don't have to check continuity or anything. So every, every injection has a retract, right? And split monos are stable under pushouts and n directed colimits. Uh, so this one is a, is a little exercise. So let's say that you have, uh, for example, push out. All right, and you assume that this one is an injection and you want to show that this one, is it an injection or not? Well, to prove that it's an injection, it's sufficient to provide a, a left inverse like this. So you use your left inverse like this here. And here, you want to define a map like this. Well, you want to define a map to B. Here, you take the identity of B. And here, you take, uh, let's say this is F, you take FP. And this defines for you a left inverse of this inclusion here. All right. And similarly for n directed colimits. Okay, so this is a bit uh, subtle because uh, typically we think that, uh, well, we have some kind of stability, blah, blah. Here it's a very uh, concrete argument about sets, right? Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not trivial. Uh, actually, I, I have to thank uh, Muriel Livernet for uh, <laughs> telling me about it because uh, I was confused at first, but she set me straight. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so now we want to prove uh, the converse. We want to prove that C is included in this thing here. And uh, I see that I have one minute left, so I will try to, to be quick. So assume that uh, I from A to B is an injection in a set, all right? Uh, and we want to show that it, let us show that I is in I cell and I cell, it's a little exercise to show that it's always included. If you have uh, some class of morphisms here, it's always included in a class defined like this. All right. So let uh, A zero be A and we want to define A0 included in A1, included in A2, blah, blah, blah. Such that every time here you have an injection. Uh, right? And well, uh, IK, so this is uh, IK, is a bijection up to dimension K. So essentially, uh, we want to build uh, uh, to dimension K minus one. All right, uh, what is, uh... Oh, 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 yes, 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 uh, this, uh, this is F, sorry. F is the top one, not the bottom one. Yeah, sorry about that. 
All right. Uh, so the idea here is that we start from A0, which is A, and we are going to glue uh, cells. So, okay, maybe I, I will do a shift in degree. I will start with minus one. And I will glue enough zero simplices to, uh, to A, such that we have a bijection in degree zero. Then enough simplices so that we have a, an inclusion in degree one, degree two, and so on. And at the end, at the end, the colimit of A k will be B, and A into the colimit of the A k is in I cell. So essentially, I want to show that this inclusion here can be obtained as this inclusion here, which is obviously, which will be a colimit. All right. So the way you do it. You put SK is the set of non-degenerate K simplices of B, which are not contained in A. And you define AK, so to, to define, sorry. I will be quick to define AK plus one. Uh, if you are looking at minus, there is a little shift in degree. You take X in SK plus one. And here you have the boundary. And you define the push out like this. Where here, how do you define this map? Well, up to degree k, the inclusion of a k into b is a bijection, and all the faces of s k are in degree uh, of s k plus one here are in degree k, so they are already in a k. So you define it like this on the faces, and then to get the inclusion, well, you here yeah, this is the inclusion. And here, well, by definition here, it's a simplex of B. So it defines a map from delta K plus one, sorry, into BK, all right? And by construction, uh, if IK is in bij a bijection in degree less than K, then IK plus one is a bijection in degree less than K plus one. All right, because we have only glued non-degenerate simplices in degree K plus one, and we have glued just enough simplices in degree K plus one so that we get uh, actually what we want. All right, uh, yes, it should be SK plus one, all right? So that's essentially the argument. You can, uh, whenever you have an injection like this, you can glue cells degree by degree to uh, get the bigger simplex from the smaller one. So in particular, uh, you get a, a cellular, uh, high cellular injection, uh, which is therefore uh, something which has the correct lifting property. All right? So this is something that we are going uh, to use a few times, that any injection can be uh, defined as a co-limit of push-outs along, the, along these inclusions, right? All right, so I'm again over time. Uh, I really apologize. Uh, so I guess I should stop here. Are there any questions before I, I stop uh, the recording? No. Okay, so I will. Uh, so just to let you know what's going on. So next Monday we are going to finish proving this theorem. I hope, uh, and then uh, try to do uh, rational multiple stuff. Hopefully by the start of next Friday. Right. All right. So I'm stopping.